Hey kids, this is Ivan. How you doing? You know, sometimes the same subject comes up over and over and over again. You get sick of hearing about it and talking about it. Uh, but every once in a while, the subject comes up and you realize that you have a different perspective. You're seeing it through different eyes. And that's kind of happened to me recently, so I want to talk about it a little bit. You know, some months ago, maybe six months, I'm not sure, uh, maybe I'll link the video. I made a video called, It's a Trap. And, you know, as usual, the subject of traps showed up in, I think it was probably the RPG Brigade. And in that video, I mostly talk about um, the perspective of, like, why would you put a trap in your world? Why would I put a trap in the world? And it came from a very simulationist um, perspective. It had to make, you know, the world had to make internal sense. The trap had to make sense in the world. And this is a, a warning right here. I am going to talk about the big model and GNS theory a little bit in this. <laughs> okay. Or as, as best as, as I can. Um, but once again... You know, we're in uh, Jason's uh, uh, group he made for basic fantasy role-playing game. And uh, Sam, Chalice and Chains, brought a video to our attention. It's by a YouTube uh, content provider. And every once in a while I do this, I'm not being pretentious. I'm just looking at this other screen and I need progressives. And that focal length is not so good in these, these bifocals. Uh, YouTube content provider called Taking 20. And his video is called something like, uh, Are Traps the Worst Form of Cheating? And so this video isn't really a video response to this, but the typical discussion started, and I realized all of a sudden that we weren't talking about traps. So that video wasn't even really about traps. That, you know, 99% of the time when we were talking about traps and having these arguments, um, that's not what we're talking about. Because, you know, often, you know, we have discussions about traps, they can get very heated, you know, or other, other similar subjects, and we can go away, you know, just shaking our heads, like, wondering, like, how can this other guy be so dense or not get it? But... I posit that we're coming with very different intentions in many uh, many cases, and so we're, we're butting heads because we're not understanding each other, and we're not understanding our, our intentions for play, and you know why you know they're not jiving. Um, so anyhow, this video is not really going to be a video response to this uh, taking twenty video, but I will do what he you know do do what he asked. He asked if anybody made comments to his video that they give some kind of context in terms of you know what edition of D and D did you start playing and what edition are you playing now? I think his video was kind of based. Um, focused on 5th edition D&D, &D, although the, the, the topic is, you know, it's, it's system neutral, to be quite honest. Uh, so for what it's worth, I started playing Molde Basic D&D &D in 1981. Yes, I'm a little older. Uh, I played a lot of AD&D 1st edition immediately thereafter, and now when I play D&D light games, I play OSR Retro Clones. But I play a bunch of other games now, which is a great thing. Um, his video was g full of really good advice. He articulated his point of view really well. Um, he gave uh, great advice on foreshadowing. The, the examples he gave of foreshadowing were excellent. The idea, like the example I'll give you, is like the Raiders of the Lost Ark. That, you know, opening scene where they're going into the temple and they discover these skeletons impaled on the stakes. And it's, it's foreshadowing, you know, screaming foreshadowing. This is a trap. In fact, the trap is right here. This is the trap you're standing right in the middle of, you know. It's time to be careful, kids. Um, likewise, he gave great advice to not be so rigid uh, as a game master, and consider creative solutions, you know, brought by players. In other words, if you haven't considered X, Y, and Z, and the players bring this up as a way to avoid the trap, get out of the trap, you know, mitigate its effects, etc., you know, you know, allow them to do that. Like, give, give those ideas consideration. That's great, you know, playing by your players. Um, however, much of what he said came from the perspective of playing RPGs in a way that suggested a gamist creative agenda. I am not knocking that. I'm not saying that's wrong. But... Um, Part of what I'll talk about in this video is the idea that, like, you know, coming from that particular agenda, and even, like, from a narrativist agenda, you know, a lot of times you will butt heads with somebody that's coming from a more simulationist agenda, especially if they're, like, why was why is the trap there in the first place? But, you know, his preference was, was really evidenced by things he said, like using traps as encounters, using traps as a tax, you know, like a hit point drain. He gave the example of, like, a pit trap doesn't kill you, just, you know, removes a bunch of hit points. Um, using traps as challenges... Using traps as a game master when you feel like, well, you need to put something here. I'm not really sure what. Let's put a trap there. And, you know, he gave the uh, the rebuttal. Like, no, just make another encounter. Instead of having a pit trap that takes away some hit points, go ahead, throw some goblins, you know, in, in the next room. And you can have an, a fun encounter rather than just like, oh, I fell down to a lousy pit trap. You know, but all this was said in the context of utilizing traps as a method in the game to wear players down and to challenge them, which is obviously, you know, really gamist in nature. And, and not surprisingly, he objected to the no-win scenario. You know, once again, this proves to be really irksome to uh, somebody that prefers a gamist narrative, uh, creative agenda, and actually probably to most people. You know, but here's the thing, like when caught in a trap that doesn't kill you outright, the gamist agenda demands there be a possibility to escape, you know, that you can still play the game. And, you know, he gave this great example from a, uh, a Dungeon Crawl Classics module. I don't know the module, to be honest with you, but 
there's a trap. Once you spring it, you're inside a room. It starts to temperature starts to plummet. You freeze to death, and it's spelled out in the description of the trap. If you try to use magical fire, normal fire, all the things that you would think of to do, none of it works. It's a no-win situation. You know, you're stuck, and you know that is, is going to fly right in the face of somebody who is there to, to you know, step on up to play the game because at that point they can no longer play the game, and their the character's not even dead yet. Um, you know, foreshadowing of, of a trap. You know, also, you know, likewise, still allows the players to play the game, to see the clues, to make perception checks, uh, to invoke the mechanics themselves. Um, a game master that rolls in secret, you know, as I've done many times, as, as lots of, you know, people will tell you to do, you know, where you're, you're deciding, well, you know what, the players don't know to look for something here, but, I, you know, there's not even any blood in the wall or, or skeletons on the spikes for foreshadowing. i got to roll for some perception here. When you do that... Um, the, the player that prefers the gamist uh, creative agenda gets really upset because they didn't get to play the game. They did not get to roll the dice and, and vote the mechanic. Um, now the problem with like just deciding, well, thou shalt not have traps at all, you know, as sometimes the genre, the, the internal world consistency, it demands they be there. You know, but that's not necessarily the concern of a, of a gamist or, or narrativist uh, uh, creative agenda, to be honest with you. Um, you know, and a lot of times what happens, you know, and I think this is one of the re reasons that people get really ticked off, is they become deprotagonized. And I'm not going to go any more into that term, but I think it's probably the most apt. But you, you've suffered this unsatisfying or meaningless death at the hands of not even a mook, not even like, you know, a, a random uh, monster encounter, but at a trap, <laughs> some inanimate object. And that'll completely ignore the needs of, like, a narrative's creative agenda, you know. There are some games, and I can't remember which ones. Um, I remember John Allen Lodge, Large, the, the Red Dice Diaries. He talked about one. I want to say it's either Dungeon World or, or One of the Fates, um, where you know you can be marked for death. In other words, the dice have determined that you're dead. But you don't die there because it's a trap for crying out loud. This isn't really cool. But we're, you're marked for death, and we're going to wait until a suitably dramatic moment for you to die. You know, um, Whereas just being crushed by, by some, some pit trap or, you know, a sliding uh, wall or whatever, not really going to do it for you at that point. Um, and I suppose, really, um, being deprotagonized in that manner can, can also be still considered a game's concern, as, you know, you, you could technically win by perishing in some really epic manner, worthy of being sung in ballads for generations, you know. But if you're dying at, at the hands of some, you know, uh, trap, this ignoble death, you know, not so much. And, you know, here's one thing uh, I thought of, you know, kind of tangentially, but like in all the, you know, um, creative agendas, you know, with players that, can, that, that prefer those, you have to be really careful of not treading on the character concept. Now, sure, people can engage in some character poisoning. In other words, you know, they, um, they'll end up feeling kind of deep protagonized or you've stepped on their character concept, but they don't really have any basis for their assertion that their character is that good you know, that nimble, that perceptive or whatnot, they would have noticed a trap or had a chance, you know, within the context of the rules because the rules don't back them up. That's another topic, though. Um, but, you know, it, when, you're, when you're being mindful of that character concept, you know, in, in I guess, a narrative-type uh, play, that can mean, like, not killing the character and treading on the theme or the premise of the play. Now, this person's a protagonist, and we're supposed to be ex exploring some kind of theme, and you knock him off by some block that uh, falls from the ceiling when you knock on the door asking for Captain Shanky, the Goblin Chief, which happened in a game just the other day. Uh, it was great. Um, <laughs> that doesn't really work really well. Um, you know, in, in gamist, you know, um, style play, that could just simply mean like not allowing them to play, like I've been talking about. You know, but you're using you know something that uh, like a fiat just to force them to lose. Like you didn't notice this, you had no chance. Um, you didn't get a chance to make a saving throw, whatever. You didn't get a chance to play the game. You were just complete. Your your character's um, concept was completely ignored. And your ability to play was completely ignored. And even in simulationism, you know, that could just simply mean ignoring character comp competencies, like right on the sheet. Like, you know, particularly when it's supported by the system. Yes, your character is that perceptive or, or that nimble. They should have had some kind of chance. Um, but, you know, context is really kind of everything. You know, for me, you have to ask, like, what's the rationale for the trap? And is it emulation of a gonzo or meat grinder tournament module? Because, you know, those early TSR, you know, uh, modules, they were tournament modules. It was like, how long can you survive this module? Uh, and, and, you know, you were scored in those old tournaments way before my time. Um, or the conventions I did not go to because I was too young. And, you know, far too many game masters will make the mistake of emulating those and decide, well, that's the way I should run my entire game. 
but sometimes you show up to play and it is, you know, you have to understand. You have to make every all your players understand. That's what they're showing up for. If you're playing some, you know, module that's kind of emulating that by by uh, um, some uh, third party publisher or, you know, whether the game master has made that, just people have to understand this this is going to be a meat grinder. That's that's the reason it's there. Sometimes the trap is there because the game master is on a power trap uh, trip. Power trap, yeah, but a power trip and enjoys being adversarial. We, we call those people jerks. Um, sometimes the trap is there. The rationale is it's as an encounter or a challenge. Um, sometimes it is there as a tax to wear players down. But sometimes it's there as genre emulation. Sometimes it's there because that's what the bad guy would do. You know, it's it, it, internal game world consistency. Now, coming from a more simulationist perspective, which is what I talked about in my original video, but didn't really consider the bigger picture here because we're not talking about traps. But simulation is trap placement, uh, if that's even a term. It's not about challenge. It's not attacks. It's not even about player game master interaction. The traps are there because they, you know, they have to make sense uh, and have context within the game world fiction. And let's go back to the Raiders of the Lost Ark, that, that opening scene. The, the traps there, they have great rationale in the game world. The traps made sense because the builders of the temple did not want anybody disturbing the temple or its contents. That's why they're there. It's not, they're not a game construct, they just make sense for the fiction. Um, and it makes sense for, in, in terms of like, you know, they built the temple, that's why it's there. It's not a challenge for the players to overcome, that's simply what's there. Um, and they also made sense in terms of genre, because, you know, they made sense uh, for the heroic pulp scenes that they helped to create. You know, it's a great scene when he's running out of there. That's why the traps are there in Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, um, so... One of the things that uh, simulation and trap uh, placement are not about is they're not about story. They're not about challenge. They're not attacks or resource drain. They're not an encounter. And they're definitely not there to screw the players. You know? So here's what happens, though. T to me, it's like if you remove jerk DMs from the mix, you know, get rid of that part of the equation, then you remove like tournament modules or that type of you know, a play that emulates tournament modules, then the questions you finally have to ask when we're having this traps argument or discussion is to the game master, why did you put the trap there? What was your rationale? What is it really there for? And it's going to be one of those things I listed. Then to the player, why are you upset that the trap is there? Specifically, what about the scenario concerning the trap upset you? And I believe, more often than not, what you'll find is you're really having a clash of intentions. The the game master and the players might be there for different experiences. And so that, I believe, is more at the heart of the traps argument than traps. What do you think about all that?